All right, welcome to the third lecture in our series in Unit 3. And today we'll be talking about heat transfers, and we'll also be talking a little bit about evaporation beginning that so that when you come into lab tomorrow, uh, we'll just further discuss that and get into our lab on evaporation. So why don't we get started here? So starting off with heat transfer, and one of the things that we've been looking at with heat and we've mentioned in class is that heat always travels from hot to cold. And that's not just dealing with heat, really in any forms of energy, Energy is always going to flow from high to low, and that's because nature favors equilibrium. They don't want things to be a little too high or a little too low. We try to equal things out, and we saw that with when we looked at density of, of liquids, and we saw how the hot water and the cold water had different densities, but eventually we knew that the hot water was going to transfer heat energy to the cold water, and then the two would mix. So we've already seen an example of that. Now, how heat transfers is in one of three ways, conduction, convection, and radiation. So that means that heat's going to go from one place to another in one of these three ways. So why don't we take a look at these methods here, and why don't we look at first starting off with conduction. Now, conduction is probably the most common one that you are most to, and if you touch something that you are transferring heat through conduction. So it occurs when two objects touch one another. Now, in order for that heat to transfer through conduction, the two objects that are touching one another must have different temperatures. One must be higher than the other. So that means that since heat always travels through from hot to cold, it's going to travel from the object of a higher temperature to an object of lower temperature. So if you touch a hot object, heat's going to transfer from that hot object to your hand. If you touch a cold object, heat's going to transfer from your hand to the colder object. And that's just through collisions, so that as the particles of the two objects are colliding with one another, they are transferring energy from one place to another. The faster molecules will always give up energy. That means that they gain or they lose thermal energy. The slower molecules will gain that thermal energy until, again, they, they reach equilibrium. And we've already seen about conductors and insulators before. And essentially, conductors are substances that allow heat to transfer easily. All right, insulators do not, or they impede the heat transfer. And that doesn't mean they stop it. They just slow down that transfer of energy. And we've seen a bunch of examples of that in the past few chapters. And metals and liquids, they tend to be good conductors because particles are close to one another. They're easy to touch, and they can transfer easily. Insulators, gases, they're poor conductors because, remember, in gases, particles are far away from one another, so the chances of them colliding with one another through conduction is very, very poor. So the next type we look at is convection. Now, conduction involves particles that are moving. Convection involves fluids, and we're talking about gases and liquids here that rise and fall. And we've seen examples of convection before. All right, if you're in your house, the higher levels of your house, the upper levels of your house, tend to be warmer than the lower levels because heat rises. As we give more energy into the particles, they become less dense, they become less dense in the colder air and they flow up. Same thing with water. Water will do the same thing. Hot water tends to stay at the top of the liquid. The cooler water tends to fall to the bottom of the liquid. And hot air balloons are a great example of how convection currents work. It's always a continuous pattern. We're adding energy, we're removing energy. We're adding energy, we're removing energy. So that means particles are going to rise and fall. And again, it has to do with density <clears throat> excuse me, and energy. So we look through heat transfer in terms of convection. Now the last type, radiation, is different than both because both conduction and convection rely on particles moving. Radiation does not rely on matter at all. It relies more on energy waves, and this is how we get heat from the sun, even though it's millions of miles away, even though it's in the vacuum of space, which has no particles, we can still feel that energy, and it has to do with those energy waves, all right, and the absorption and emission of energy from electrons, and it gets a little bit more involved with that, but that's why radiation in, in, the, in wintertime, that's why ice and snow can melt, even though the temperature may be below the freezing point, because it's gaining energy from the sun, the sun is putting energy into the ice, into the snow, and thus being able to melt it even, even if it is freezing outside. 
Now it's come to our favorite part of the notes and our brain break time. So why don't we get up from the computer, run a few laps around the house, and get our blood flowing. And today's Chuck Norris fact of the day, there is no theory of evolution, just a list of animals Chuck Norris allows to live. Make sure you mention that to your biology teachers next year. So we're going to shift gears here and go back to our phase changes. And today we're going to look at evaporation. Now evaporation, remember, is one of our phase changes. And refer back to our last set of notes to look at the different phase changes that we have. And evaporation is part of the phase change of vaporization along with boiling, which means we have a liquid converting into a vapor. But the difference between evaporation and boiling has to do with temperature. And with evaporation, it happens below the boiling point. Now, just let's refer back to our notes from last time. We know that in the case of water, our boiling point of water, and we're going to write BP of H2O here, is 100 degrees Celsius. So we know that at 100 degrees Celsius, we give the particles of water enough energy to overcome attractive forces between them, to overcome atmospheric pressure, so that they can escape into the vapor phase. Well, evaporation, still the same phase changes, but that happens below 100 degrees Celsius. So evaporation can really occur anywhere between 1 and 99 degrees Celsius. So we still have the liquid converting into the vapor, but it's happening below that temperature, which just means some of those particles have enough energy in order to vaporize. And the only particles that are going to vaporize are going to be the ones at the surface of the liquid. So the closer we get to that boiling point, the more evaporation we're going to have. Now, along with boiling, Evaporation does require the addition of heat. We need to still add energy to that. And when we add enough energy, we can evaporate a liquid into the vapor phase. So what are some factors? What are some things that can affect how evaporation rate occurs, how fast or how slow those liquids are going to convert into the vapor? Well, the first one, probably the most important one, is temperature. And remember that temperature has to do with the speed of the particles. The faster the particles are moving, the hotter the liquid is, the faster the rate of evaporation is going to occur. So if you have, let's say, a beaker at 10 degrees Celsius and a beaker at 80 degrees Celsius, the 80 degree water is going to evaporate at a much faster rate than the 10 degree water because it has more energy and more speed. Another factor, motion. So the energy doesn't always have to be heat. We can add motion in terms of wind blowing on something, stirring something, and adding energy to those particles. So water on a windy day will evaporate at a much faster rate than on a calm day. Another factor has to do with the substance, the attractive forces themselves. The stronger the attractive force, the harder it's going to be for that liquid to evaporate. And the last one is mass. And the heavier the particle, the more energy we're going to need in order to get it to evaporate. So when we look at all of these factors together, it could be one, it could be two, it could be all of them that could affect how fast or how slow something evaporates. So we're going to end the notes here for today, and tomorrow when you come in, we'll talk a little bit about evaporation, and we're going to be looking at evaporation as a process, and our lab will involve those evaporation rates and some of the factors that we have looked at here today. So I look forward to seeing you tomorrow, and have a good night.